Tim O'Brien, welcome to the show. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. It's been a really long time since uh, since we've talked. We know each other from the old linked linked LA days, the yeah. late lamented. Um, and the reason I wanted to have you on the show was uh, you're someone that always knows how to keep things positive. And uh, I've seen you I've seen you talk so many times, and and you teach people how to take their best assets and 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 put that forward and. Um, I think that's really important in this time. So thank you for being here. I'm glad to be here. Uh, one thing I always like to talk about in the beginning is uh, the backgrounds. Um, so I, I picked this background because when I think of you, I think about, you know, Main Street and, and you know, everyday businesses and what it is that, that you do to, adver to help them advertise. Okay, come in, welcome, we're open for business. So that's what you are to me. So hope that, hope that works for you. Yeah. Well, it, it definitely does. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you why, because I mean, as you know, my, when you talk about, you know, helping people differentiate themselves, you know, the focus is on your personal brand. And years ago, uh, before social media, you know, before we were primarily a service driven economy, you know, personal branding was thought to be for people who were famous movie stars or, Act, uh, or, or uh, professional athletes or politicians. But, you know, the fact that 79.4% of our GDP is service sector driven, which means people are selling things that are, that are invisible, more and more people are becoming the product. So it's kind of the, the way our economy has evolved, evolved has kind of democratized the concept of personal branding. And it applies to, as much as it applies to LeBron James or Beyonce, it applies to you and me in our day-to-day -day activities. So, so how did you wind up doing this and how did you get good at it? Uh, it was kind of a circuitous path. My background was I was a lawyer um, and I didn't, you know, I, 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 from the very beginning, I knew I, I didn't want to practice law. Um, and then I actually uh, I pursued a, a, a dream that I had of being an actor. And I remember being one of the first acting classes and there was a guy, uh, Marcello Rolando, who was, uh, he was teaching the, the power hour and it was all about personal empowerment. And it just, I mean, it was like mana for me, you know, I just, and then, you know, I continued on the path of being an actor and eventually came out to California and, you know, tried my best to succeed, didn't get picked. And then it became time to, you know, I thought I needed to make a transition and was I going to go back to being a lawyer? But by this time I had fully immersed myself in personal development and I was like, no, I want to be in this space. And then I got into the space and you sort of, you know, you get into it, you try this, you try that, and eventually you sort of fix, find your niche. And what I did was I asked myself, what was I really good at? And I was really good, I thought, at building rapport. And I was going to teach people how to build rapport and build relationships. And eventually it evolved into, you know, the concept of personal branding. And what I really like about it, Martin, is I got my start in, in public speaking or, or personal development in the California prison system. I wasn't a prisoner, but I, really, I did, yeah. yeah, I did motivational speeches and for prisoners and at the core of it was personal branding. And I've gone on to speak to, you know, CEOs, from, you know, YPO, I've traveled around Europe speaking on personal branding. And one of the great things about it is I never have to change my message, right? Because everybody has a brand. It's either positive, negative, or neutral. So if I were to do something on leadership and say, hey, here's a leadership technique you should do. You know, it doesn't apply to everybody equally. You've got to be more mindful of your audience, you know. For me, um, this is it. I mean, if you want to ignore your brand, go ahead. If you want to build your brand, go ahead. And it, that's, it's, it's a universal concept that applies to everybody, no matter where you find yourself. Well, I, th I think the thing that people struggle with is that, um, for some people anyway, the, the way they talk about branding winds up being pretentious. And I, I don't think that's the way you, you mean it. I mean, you, whether you say you call it your personal brand or what people know you for, if you think back, you know, a hundred years ago when a, a man's word was his bond and, and you didn't shake someone's hand and promise something without delivering on it. Um, that was your brand back then though. You know, they wouldn't have thought uh, to call it that, but essentially what you're talking about is your reputation as much as your brand, right? And, and you're right. That's just a great line. I mean, that's really it. They didn't call it back then, personal branding. 
You know, it's sort of a, a that nomenclature is much more modern, but it existed back then. I mean, when you were even practicing law, you know, the, the, the witnesses, you believe the best brands, yeah. you know, somebody gets on the stand and, you know, he's, you know, he's kind of slippery. What you're really basically saying is I don't trust his brand. And so, um, but it becomes much more relevant in the business place today because, you know, the product took precedence. But today, when you're selling, it means they need to see something to really be comfortable with their choice. So if they can't see what they're buying because it's financial services or if it's a, a if it's um, you know legal services or or negotiations, if you can't see that, you've got to see something else to make you comfortable making that choice. And that thing is is your brand. So it becomes so relevant today for like you said, I love it. You know, I, I appreciate when you say. You think of Main Street because the truth of the matter is personal branding has dropped down from the, the, the high profile to the rest of us, the rank and file in our day-to-day -day lives. Well, when you think about it, the change with, um, I, I remember when I first started looking at Yelp and uh, people thought that my superpower was picking great restaurants and they just couldn't <laughs> understand like, you know, all the best places. <laughs> But, but, when, awesome. right? but when, when Yelp first came out, I was like, okay, if any time I'm taking somebody out to lunch, I want something four stars or better. And I found out that I just had really good experiences with that. Now, you know, I've got friends in the restaurant business and they, they tend tenaciously to their Yelp reputations because it's real money there, right? But um, even if Yelp yes. isn't in the space you're in, um, you know, so like I'm, I'm in the healthcare market and I, I help uh, mm -hmm. practices improve their, their data technology and, and their communication. Um, it's amazing how much healthcare people talk to one another. And if you have a bad brand, we'll call it, you know, old fashioned bad reputation, uh, it follows you around mm -hmm. everywhere. And, you know, back when I was in yeah. the, um, the entertainment business, that was true just as much as anything else. Uh, people from this record company quote unquote really knew their their marketing but you don't want to get anyone that that does radio promotion from that you know, those guys don't know what they're doing which may not be true but that was their reputation right and so um mm -hmm. so what is it yeah, i mean you, remember like marlon brando for a long time his personal brand he was difficult to work with so you know the jobs kind of dried up and what a lot of people don't know is he had to audition for the role in the godfather because he had built a personal brand up that the guy so difficult, his talent did not exceed how difficult he was. It was the opposite. So I don't want to do business with him. He's too difficult. Yeah. And he, I mean, here's a guy who was, you know, regarded at the time as of the greatest American actor having to audition for roles. Yeah. So, so one thing that brings up for me and, and, you know, uh, when you look at your clients, uh, how how do you get them to take a look at what their current brand or reputation actually is versus what they pretend it is? Do you know what I mean by that? I do. I do. And it all does start with a, a, a good self-reflection. You know, there was a study, uh, Martin, done in Men's Health Magazine years ago, and they wanted to know how many men thought they were good looking. So they surveyed all their members, all their subscribers, and they gave them three choices, very good looking, good looking, not good looking. And here's what the, the, all the results were. It's not a joke. It's the, the truth. They found that 80% of all men think they're really good looking. Now, 80% of men are probably not really good looking, right? They're probably, 80% of men are probably not good looking. You know, it's probably a smattering between all three. Right. And I, I, I share that with you because it does start with a willingness to have a true, you know, a true self-perspective because you've got to come at it from a position of authenticity. We would all love to be Brad Pitt or, or, you know, or Beyonce or, or, you know, LeBron James, these superstars. But I tell people, sometimes you just got to, you know, you got to embrace your Urkel. Yeah. And Urkel had an amazing career, right? Tom Hanks. Sure. You know, I'd love to be this, you know, sexy movie star, but his brand is he's a nice guy. And nice guy has turned him into maybe the most popular movie star in the world at one point in time. Yeah. So it, 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 there's got to be a willingness. You can't force people. You've got to be a willingness. There's got to be a willingness to say, hey, 
I really want to, to get a sense of what are the, what are my real attributes that I should be building my brand on? And if you don't, if you can't get people to get to that space, you're wasting your time. Yeah. So, yeah. So you might, you, you might do well if you're, if you're, but whether you're a man or woman or uh, you, you may do really well with the opposite sex, regardless of what your, your attributes are. But if you're, you know, if, if you're Brad Pitt, uh, the, the, the line that works on the ladies for you might not be the same that if you look like me. Um, not that I'm not devastatingly good looking, but. Um, well, I'm glad that you clarify because you are. Yeah. But if, if you look at it realistically, um, that's true for everything else. So if you're LeBron James and you're starting a podcast, uh, you probably could skip some steps that Martin Devon really can't skip. And, yep. You know, yep. so even if it's a train wreck, people are going to look at okay, who, LeBron James is interviewing people. Let's take a look at that. Whereas, you know, there's, there's some things I need to do in order to, to build credibility and to build an audience that he wouldn't have to do. So the thing I always wonder when people, when, when business people look at their brand, um, what is it, what is a common thing that they overlook that they need to take account for? Like, it's easy to say you're good looking, you're not good looking, but if you're a business person that's in the, you know, I don't know, let's say, give me an example of, of who you would help and how you would start that out, that conversation out with them. Well, a lot of times um, what happens is people wrap their brand up in, in what they do for a living and their title and how much money they make. So you get people that make a lot of money and there's a lot of people just like in sports and just like in entertainment that make their living off of this person being successful. So they indulge a lot of behavior, right? Whereas they wouldn't indulge you and me. Right. You know, sometimes I'm, it's remarkable when I see people behave certain ways in the public eye and there are people that actually defend them and really by any objective standard that the, the behavior is indefensible, but nobody's perfect. I mean, you make mistakes, you, you, you know, you're contrite, you ask for forgiveness and, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time people forgive you, but you get people who are reluctant to, um, to acknowledge that, that maybe there are a lot, you know, lower down on that on that personal brand credibility scale than they thought they were because what they did was they wrapped their brand up in hey i make a lot of money hey i'm the ceo you know hey i'm the leader in my industry hey i have some degree of fame you see it a lot and and today like and i know people you, you when you venture into politics you know it can be divisive but for me and you, Martin, I don't, I'm just using it illustratively. So let's look at a guy like Michael Bloomberg, right? And here's a guy who was a successful mayor of New York, spent $400 million and got three, three votes, you know, three delegates from the island of Samoa. At the end of the day, just because you make a lot of money, it doesn't mean that you can, you have a great personal brand. And what's really important is, is that you detach from any of the things that might, might, um, get in the way from you making that true assessment. And one of the first things you have to do is make sure you surround yourself with people who tell you the truth. It's critical. And that's hard because if I'm really successful in terms of money and fame and why would I want to surround myself with people who tell me, you know, hey, you're misbehaving. Right? Yeah. But it's really important that you have those people around you. Yeah. So it starts me with that being willing to hear the truth. So, so when you start working with the clients, you, you, I guess you can tell pretty soon whether they can hear the truth or not. Um, do, do you just say, oh, we're not right. a good fit if, if you can see they don't, they don't want to hear the truth? Yeah, and it's not an easy conversation for a couple of reasons. One is, you know, you, 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 we're in the business of, of helping people and making money helping people. So you want to try to help clients as much as you possibly can. Um, and the other thing is it's not, you know, when you're going to have a conversation with somebody like that, not people aren't always receptive to it. Here's what usually happens. It usually runs its natural course because early on people get excited because I'm bringing new energetic concepts to them, but the rubber really hits the road and they have to start to implement. So when you start having meetings where you start being repetitive in what you're reinforcing, it becomes clear that these people are not going to implement. And so what happens is it it kind of runs its course. So the way I work with people is I work on a quarterly basis because I want to out and I want them to have an out. 
So at the end of the first quarter, if you're not doing the work, hey, it's just, it's, we, we've done what I think we can do. You, you know, again, I'm not in the business of gratuitously telling people, you know, you're, you're not available, you're, you're not open, you know, there's something wrong with you. I, I'm not interested in that. It's a, it's a way for us to gracefully exit from the relationship. Whereas before, you know, I'd say, okay, we'll work together for a year. And then by the ninth month, it was just like sticking bamboo shoots under your fingernails for both, right? For you both. know, for, for, for them as well. So, you know, it, it, it's all about exiting from the relationship gracefully for them too. Let's say, for example, they're not getting, it's been a good quarter. Let me implement what I'm doing and maybe we'll circle back at a later date. Sure. It, 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 it also allows you to get really specific around your goals when you do it quarterly. So you're yeah. really clear. Did you get what you wanted out of the first quarter? And, is, and here's the what's, what's up next. Is it worth it to you to put in the work and the money to do that? And that, that makes sense. And there, I, I'll tell you, there's two things that, you, you know, you just used a word that's really, you, you can't overstate it enough. Put in the work. Yeah. See, I, can, I get you excited because I pick your brand with you. Like I take you through this process that I've created, pick your brand, and you're energized by it. But, but that's the easy part. Now what you have to do is you got to start to behave in a certain way and it's got to be authentic. You got to start to change, you know, and that's hard for people. And everything you do either adds to or takes away from your personal brand credibility. So you start to think intentionally about how you're acting on a day-to-day -day basis. A lot of people just don't want to do that. So when you, you said that work, are you willing to do the work? Because building a great brand is work. It is work. Well, the, the, the thing that people don't realize is there's the brand you pick and there's a brand people pick for you. And those aren't the same thing, right? Well, you, your, your job, from my perspective, is to, is to decide what your brand is and then work energetically to create that word or phrase in the mind of another, right? Now, if you're LeBron James or you're, you're, you know, you're Oprah, you have a team of people. You have millions of dollars that are reinforcing that brand through commercials, through social media, right? They're helping you do that. Your job, my job, is to do that by ourselves. And so what I would say is where maybe a LeBron James can um, actually choose the word they want people to think of because they have so much money, so many resources, you know, they can, they can inundate you with it to the point where it almost becomes like Pavlov, Pavlovian, right? For us, what we're after, Martin, is that people say positive things about you and me. That's what we're after. And every now and then they ring the bell. They say exactly the word or phrase we want them to say. But if we can get people to say mostly positive things about us, we're in good shape. We've done a good job. But you're, you're, you're really underlying, a, in, in the people you're picking as an example, you're really underlying the point. Because yes, Oprah and, and LeBron have a lot of money and they have a lot of help but they also put in the work. So in terms of, you know, you, you, you can, you know, I'm not a huge basketball fan, but you know, I definitely know that LeBron's a really good player, but beyond yep. being a really good player, um, he drags his teams to success, yes. whether they want to or not, whether it's pretty or not pretty. And, 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 you know, um, the, the same thing for Oprah, she walks the walk. Um, she, I may not be in her target demographic, but I definitely recognize that, uh, many of the women in my life, you know, they're enthusiastic about whatever Oprah has to say and whatever, if, if, if she recommends a book, a lot of them will read it. Whereas your point around Michael Bloomberg, um, people want to buy his, um, his tools for stock, or they may, they may, you know, use some of the, in, in yeah. that area, he's got that brand, but Absolutely. you know, his brand didn't extend like the stuff he was really good at. He was really good at. And um, I wasn't living in New York at the time that, that, that he was the mayor, but I know a lot of New Yorkers that were really pleased with, I mean, his Very brand much. was along with what they wanted. But when it comes to being the Democratic nominee, his brand didn't hit what the new customers, which would be the Democratic uh, primary voters, wanted in a candidate. However you want to phrase it, without, you know, bottom line, he, his, his brand didn't carry the day in the way that you're talking about. Um, you know, you, 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 I want to just say, you, I mean, to kind of simplify it, because it's right on the money. There's two things I think you said, which are really spot on. One is the target demographic. 
And, and then two is your brand has nothing to do with what you think of you. We think we're awesome, period, end of story. The real barometer is what do you feel about me? The people that are watching it, what do they feel about us? That's, that's what matters when it comes to personal branding. We think we're doing a fantastic job here imparting great wisdom. At the end of the day, the measurement is solely in the hands of your target audience. Similarly, when you said about Oprah, she's right. I mean, you're right about that. You need to know who your target audience is. You know, my mom used to have an expression, take it from where it comes, right? So you might receive criticism. A good example is Colin Kaepernick. You think Nike makes these sneakers and, you know, and people are like, how could you buy those sneakers? And the answer is they're not trying to appeal to those people. They know the demographic they're trying to appeal to. They believe they can monetize it and make money off of it. And that's what branding is all about is it's about matching the brand to the target audience. So, oh, you know, you and I walk in the room and there's a bunch of women, you know, watching Oprah give away cars and we're like, this is ridiculous. And she would be like, who cares what you think? I'm not trying to appeal to you. Right. I'm appealing to those 32 women that are screaming and yelling because they're giving a car away. Right. So it's so super important that you know who your target audience is and that you, and you know if you're running afoul of your target audience, if you're, if you're not behaving in a way that's consistent with what your target audience wants. But if it's people outside your target audience, you gotta have a six I'm not saying ignore them. Yeah. You know, you, you got to take it from where it comes. So. You know, I, I don't want to let go of this one point about being uh, clear and honest about how people see you. So like you, I've done a lot of personal development. And um, mm -hmm. one of the most amazing tools that I found was a, a well, you know, one of the courses I did was called the Self-Expression Leadership Program. They had you do an interview with people around you about, and you asked them a series of questions about you know, your leadership ability, about how much you care, how authentic, how reliable you are. You know, really difficult questions that you have to be willing to hear the answers to. And what was so amazing is like when I did mine, I realized that uh, you know, like one of the questions was something like, are you a man of your word? And the way I related to myself is I'm totally not a man of my word. I'm full of, I'm full of it. You know, I, I let people down here and here and here and here's the other Here's the, you know, there are the other places. So like my self-assessment was very low. And then everyone I interviewed was like, oh yeah, you know, bulletproof, man of his word. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Do you not know me? And, and you know, that's neither, that's neither here nor there. I, I still believe that I'm more accurate than they are, but that doesn't really matter. The point is, if you're looking at your personal brand, you want to know what actually, you know, what is your brand actually? And you want to come to grips with, um, what do people really think of you as opposed to what you pretend they think of you? And the craziest thing I discovered was you can ask them and they will tell you if you're willing to listen. So yeah. um, where, does, where does that go in your process? And, and how do you get people to confront that? <laughs> so I tell you an exercise I do in one of my classes. And let me tell you, it, it's, a, it's a hair raiser. Um, so I ran a program for years called Rainmaker U and I would get 20, you know, 15, 20 professionals in a room. We would meet once a quarter for a full day, work on personal branding. People didn't know each other in the class. So what I would do is I would get index cards. And so I would write on, let's say there were 20 people in a class. I would write Tim O'Brien on 20 index cards. I'd fold them in half. Okay. Little, little three by five, fold them in half, make them make it like a little tent. And there'd be 20 of them. So everybody came into the room and had 20 cards with their name on it. Okay. We then passed them out. And what happened was everybody got a card with everybody else's name on it. And everybody, I said, okay, now you don't know the people in the room. Have a look. What's the word or phrase that comes to mind when you think of that person? And they write it down. And if it was negative, they had to say why. And I would collect the cards back and I would get, and I'd have Martin, you know, 20, 20 cards with Martin. And we would take a break and people go pick up their cards and read them. And these were people who were pretty successful and people would be like, <clears throat> right. I mean, it was, it was, you know, bullet piercing. Right. And some people were like, oh, God, you know, and it was funny because Martin, there were some people 
um, who left their cards there. And I, at first I would wonder why, because I'd have class after class after class, not the same day, but you know, over the course of the years. And some people didn't pick up their cards till the end of the day. And I realized, you know, people's psychology was, I don't want to know right now. I'll do it at the end of the day, right? And they would avoid looking at those cards because it was painful. Nobody knew you. They had nothing to gain by being insulting or by complimenting you. And you got 20 people giving you honest, direct feedback about what they thought your brand was. It probably was worth the, and the course was $6,500. It was probably worth the cost of the course, that one exercise alone. Because imagine if you thought your brand was A and it was Z. Yeah, exactly. I remember there was that, a, that was the $1 billion that, that Bloomberg spent. And, and he I, thought his brand was A and he turned out his, his brand was Samoa. And it, 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 having nothing to do with politics, right? It's just- No. A, yep. And we're like, like, I, like, it's so funny. I'm watching and, and his tagline was, Michael, get it done. And I thought, what a terrible tagline because that's not really an issue right now. For, and you know, you know what I mean? Like I just for his that, audience, not forget whether it is or it isn't, but it's for his, it, it, for, you know, it yeah. just didn't resonate. I just thought even listening, I just thought to myself, that's a terrible tagline, right? It, it, but you spent $400 million and here's the point, right? I don't know the answer to this, but either there were a lot of consultants or, or at the end of the day, Mike made the choice and they probably like, it's great. It's great. Go with it. And I wonder if anybody sat in that room and said, that sounds really dumb, but you're afraid to speak up because there's a lot of power in that room. There's a lot of money in that room. And that's the danger. That's the, the, the danger when it comes to personal branding. So what I loved about the exercise was, I don't care what your job is. Nobody knows what you do. Nobody knows how much money you make. Nobody knows what your title is. They're just giving it to you straight. And yeah. it was really powerful. And by the way, it wasn't always negative. People, a lot of people got really positive feedback. It reinforced what they thought their brand was and it really fortified their spirit. So it wasn't about trying to get negative feedback or, or, or you know, wake people up. You know, it was just about truth. Now, it w did you do this after they got, you, you got enough of an impression of a person so it wasn't just their physical appearance? Or does no, the appearance get into it as well? They came, they came in the morning and they interacted with each other. And after a couple of hours, you know, but it wasn't, they didn't know each other See, because people make up their mind about you in one quarter of one second. Right. right. So what's really important is that you recognize that if you're breathing, you're branding and yes, it's not fair that they, that, you know, here, here's a statistic. They think people who, you know, overwhelmingly people think people who are taller are smarter than people who are shorter. Yeah. So one of the things for Bloomberg was he wanted to be able to stand on a box, but again, the lack of awareness to even suggest that knowing it would get out in the public, it, it, it minimized him. But knowing that when I'm look smaller than everybody else, people, it just naturally will cut against me. And so what I, the message I wanted to get out was, guys, what message are you sending in a fraction of a second when people meet you? Which means, how are you dressed? How are you groomed? What's your physical fitness? What's your posture? What's your energy? What's your handshake? What's your smile? All those things have enormous impact on your personal brand in a, in a fraction of a second. And once you, what was the expression? Uh, the truth shall set you free. Yeah. Whatever, whatever you're starting with, that's, that's what you're dealing with. And, you know, um, and interestingly enough, some of the things that could be considered positive for other people are negative. I have, I have uh, a number of friends that are really good looking and in certain areas, they, get, they have a hard time getting taken seriously. And yes. so, um, you know, the, every positive has a negative as well. So they have to do things or they, they you know, they overcome their advantages in a sense, uh, you just have to be clear about it. Um, so let me ask you, one of the things that I remember about you is that you, you could be in a room with 20 people and you remember everyone's name. Is that true? Well, well, I wouldn't say, I, 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 you could say that. I mean, I do my best to remember yep. people's names, right? Yep. So what is it you do to make sure that you remember people's names? So the very first thing, it's, it's, it, 
funny you ask that question because um, rem remembering people's names is a reflection of how, how emotionally connected or interested you are in people. So I want you to think about this. Have you ever forgotten the name of a really good looking woman? Of course not. Have you ever forgotten the name of a really important prospect? Of course not. Have you ever forgotten the name of your waitress, of your car parker? Of course you have. Why? Because I'm not emotionally connected. I don't really care. And what I say to people is not everybody deserves the same amount of time, but whatever time you give people, they deserve the same amount of attention, which is 100%. Now I have an advantage because I'm in the business of connecting with people. So if you're a private equity guy, you know, or if you're a, a lawyer, you know, you, you, you don't have that same obligation that, I shouldn't say obligation, you, you, it's not, you're not wired that same way. So that was a big, big advantage. And then I intentionally, you know, there's you know, neuro-linguistic programming, NLP, there are, there are mental techniques, you know, associate the name with, uh, with an image and all that sort of stuff. And if you practice it, you know, you can develop it. Yep. So, but it is important, huh? Oh, I think it's vitally important. Dale Carnegie said it best. The sweetest sound to any person, any language is the sound of their name. That is certainly true. So um, let's, let's shift a little bit from um, the, the general topics is specific. So uh, the, the COVID-19 uh, situation is impacting all of our lives and it's a major theme of this show. Um, what, do you, what do you think the opportunities are uh, for people that are stuck at home and particularly around, you know, I'd say, Scientifically speaking, 63.4% of businesses have to change the way they do things. Um, mm -hmm. I, I made that number up, obviously, for anyone that, that's wondering. Um, so, so what is it you've observed and, and what is it you think people have to do um, in these times to, to get better and to adapt? Well, I think the number one thing, and I, you and I connected because I sent out a, a link to a podcast, the seven habits of a highly effective citizen. And I think the number one thing that I am finding and very discouraging is people are not tolerant of each other, right? People process crisis in different ways. People react in different ways. And we, you know, and you have to be tolerant, right? You can't be like, oh, you're tone deaf that, you know, you want to get back to business. You know, you're just a business owner and you own a restaurant. Well, you got to appreciate that that person has to feed a family and keep people employed. Similarly, you can't be like, oh, you know, you get a paycheck, so you don't care about going back to work. No, you don't realize that that person has a, a you know, a, their mother lives with them and she's elderly, you know, or, you know, they have little kids and they're frightened because they don't know about what the impacts of COVID are, it, it, it's going to be on them. So to me, that was the first thing, like that was what hit me. Um, and, um, and so I, I think it's really impart, important, and I'm, I'm, I'm reluctant to use this word because I'm not a big believer in no judgment, because I don't, I don't think we, you live in a society where you can have no judgment, right? Um, but you have to, sort of, as hard as you can, not judge other people the way people are reacting. That's, that's the most important thing to me, Martin. The second thing is, got to be positive. You got to stay positive. And it's funny. I mean, I have, I've gotten some brush back. These are my words for being too positive. It's really important is you got to stay in shape. And I don't mean just physical shape. I mean, I mean, business shape. I mean, mental shape. And so it, 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 uh, here's a good example. When somebody becomes the heavyweight champ of the world, their, their, their trajectory usually follows the same path. They work really, really hard, let themselves get out of shape, and then they have to get back in shape. Evander Holyfield was different. He had made the commitment that he was going to stay in shape in between fights. So he might take a week or two weeks off to recuperate, but he'd get right back in the gym. So I think it's important for me is that I'm finding things to do to prepare once the gates open again. And that I'm not digging myself out of a hole, but I'm, I'm, I'm preparing. Is it cleaning up my database? I'm working on a new product right now called um, the, the self-confidence tool chest. Been wanting to do it for a long time in the 
the format, right? Five tools to help you with your self-confidence, overcome phobias, and, and, and uh, you know, address some fears. And I've um, been wanting to do it for a long time, so I'm going to use this time. I'm working on the ebook right now, and hopefully I'll have it ready to go, and I can launch it over the next week or two. So I do think it's important is that, you know, try to find those things that you can stay in shape, and maybe all you can do is stay neutral. Maybe you can't even move forward in your business, but at a, at a minimum, you maintain that status quo. And so when the gates are open, bang, you lean right into it. So I think those are three of the key things that I'm focused on anyway. All right. That's awesome. Um, what do you think in terms of uh, community? Do you, do you see anything changing? I mean, obviously, um, the country is divided in a lot of different ways. But um, is there some commonalities you could see where, where this is going to help us remember that, that we actually all care about each other? We, we kind of forgot that. Uh, you know, Martin, I'm, I'm from New Jersey, and um, I'm going to, it would be easy for me to say, you know, I think so, and I think we love each other, and I think we have to show that. Um, I don't necessarily think so. I think it's unfortunate. I think it'll be for a period of time. I wish it were different, but I saw 9-11. And after 9-11, I remember being in New Jersey and literally on the day um, and, and the days after, people were coming out of New York City. They were on the side of the road walking home because there was no transportation. And people were saying, hey, you need a ride home? And the guy would be like, yeah, but I don't live five miles. Don't worry, get in. And it was extraordinary how people were helping. I mean, extraordinary. You know, people had flags on their cars, right? Uh, the churches were filled. You know, I remember watching people let people go in front of them, you know, um, and that was 9-11, an event that, you know, was our modern day Pearl Harbor, obviously. And I don't, can, couldn't imagine us being any more united than that. But I think over time, um, I'm hopeful, but I think over time, I think people will retreat to their corners. But right now, I think people are rowing, you know, in, in the same direction with each other. And it's a great thing to see. And it's a great thing for America. And it's a great thing for our country. And uh, I do think that that unity will be sustained for a period of time, which will be vitally important for reinvigorating the economy. So, I mean, I, I, and I, I thank you for asking me that question, because I always pride myself on being truthful. I could be wrong. I hope I'm wrong. But I just didn't want to give what I thought was a cliche response. No, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I do want what you honestly think. But one of the things I wonder about, I don't think people are going to stop being people. So definitely, uh, like, you, you, people aren't going to change their perspectives on politics. They aren't going to change a lot of the, the, the core beliefs they've had. But um, definitely, I think they're going to look at risks differently than they did. So people are going to I wash agree. their hands, you know, Kids, kids who are raised today are going to wash their hands. They're going to have better hygiene. Like if you, if you go to the park and you go to the restroom in the park, you know, most people are, go, you know, uh, ladies may not like to hear this, but if you go to the, the men's room before this, the, the percentage of, of men that wash their hands after doing their business was um, not as high as you would have hoped that it would have been. And mm -hmm. I will bet you that the percentage of people washing their hands after using the washroom is going to go way up and it'll stay that way for, for at least a generation. Um, so I do think there's going to be some habits that we change. And, um, and what I'm hoping, although I, I, you know, maybe I'm being Pollyannish, I'm hoping that to a certain extent we realize how much we need each other and to have uh, maybe a, a little better understanding from a self-interested perspective that you know, where we live in a community matters and how our neighbors are doing matters. Uh, in, a, in, a, in an extent that it, it, it didn't, because we had the ability to be selfish, that we, we've, we've, we've lost. I don't know. What do you think? I think that, um, and I said this all along, I think most of us, man, woman, black, white, tall, short, ethnicities, all care and, and love each other for the most part. I think, unfortunately, there are pockets that divide the people. But sometimes I think to myself, Martin, right? Like, I don't know these people that these politicians or the media are talking about. I don't, I don't know these people because I, the people that I associate with and, you know, 
you know, and I associate with all different socioeconomic backgrounds, all people really want to do is raise their children. They want to keep their family safe. They want to live in a decent place and they want to be able to send their kids to school and educate their children. And I think for the most part, it's almost like I feel, Martin, like there's 535 politicians and some media talking heads on the one side and there's 330 million Americans on the other side because I've never seen anybody in need be refused help by another fellow citizen because of, you know, their ethnicity or their, you know what I mean? Like people coming over and borrowing milk from each other, or I see the way when people, you know, lost a life and people rally around and raise money for the family for burial costs. I think that that has always been there. I do. I think it's always been there and I think it will always be there because I think that's, I think it's almost like that's how humanity is wired. And so what I'm hopeful for is the people that have the megaphone can stop putting us in corners because I don't, I don't say it. I just, I, I see, I see the rest of us just wanting to raise our kids, feed our families, put a roof over our house, you know, go to work, have a job, earn a good living, and and get along with each other. That's how I, you know, how how I view it, right? I, you know, I think you guys stay over there. Let the rest of us just just live our lives. Beautiful. So if uh, if, if someone's interested in in connecting with you, Tim, and and uh, working on their personal brand, how do they do that? Well, you can you can. Email me certainly at tob at the personal branding group dot com, tob at the personal branding group dot com, um, or Martin, you can simply go to my website and which is the person to see dot com. So everything I do is try to help people become the person to see with their target audience, whether you know you're a financial advisor, a lawyer, or, you know whoever whoever you may be, who's your target audience? You want to be the person to see. So our website is the person to see dot com. Beautiful. And uh, so if you want to connect, um, I'd love to connect with you. I'd love to stay connected with you on social media. And um, um, that's it. All right. So. One, one last question for you, Tim. Um, with the theory that the way that we succeed in life is winning each day individually. And if you can win the day, you, you, you're well on your way to the kind of life you want. What would you leave our audience with? How, how can they win the day from your perspective? Um, I would say is simple, good, complex, bad. And what I mean by that is focus on simple things that you can execute in a cumulative way so that you gain momentum because then the momentum begins to build on itself and begins to carry you through. And that momentum, even in challenging times, is what sustains you. So the solutions are very, very simple. Focus on the simple and, and do everything you can just to execute those simple things that are right in front of you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tim. Thanks for uh, being here today and look forward to our next conversation. Awesome. Thanks for having me, Martin. All right.